The Charlotte Podcast Festival is presented by Blumenthal Performing Arts, the Queen City Podcast Network, Eclex Creative Agency, and WFAE, Charlotte's NPR news source. The home of acclaimed podcast, Charlotte Talks, She Sets, The List, Amplifier, Southbound, and FAQ City. Learn more about WFAE and our latest podcast, Work It, at WFAE.org. Welcome, everyone, to the Charlotte Podcast Festival presented by WFAE, Queen City Podcast Network, Blumenthal Performing Arts, and Eclix. My name is Joe Hunsaker. I am an event manager and comedy producer at Blumenthal Performing Arts. I'm also a podcaster. Uh, I do In the Spotlight for Blumenthal Performing Arts. American Timelines is a true crime podcast I do with my wife in the network. And I'm about to unleash the Nerd School podcast, hopefully this month, to everybody. Um, Admitting people here and there. Okay, this session is called From Money to Movie Deals. It's time to take podcasting seriously. We're going to cover the history of podcasting and the latest podcast industry stats and trends you need to know as you begin to plot your podcast path. Your speaker for tonight is the amazing Andy Go. Uh, he's a producer, consultant, host, audio engineer, editor of the Go Show and the founder of Gojo Studios. Basically, if you're trying to do a podcast in the in the CLT, Andy will make it go. Uh, you can use that, Andy, for future things. Um, this is an hour-long session. The last 15 or so will be Q&A. So if you have questions as we go, feel free to type them into the chat, and I'll try to keep track of them, and we'll ask Andy those questions at the end. Um, here and there, I might be able to sprinkle some of those questions in as we go, but as we go with Andy Go, but uh, for the most part, we're going to try to keep those at the end. The session will be recorded and made available as an archive session for those who've registered. It'll be sent out later this month via email. A short survey will also be shared after the session is complete, so please fill that out. Uh, it helps us get better at uh, making podcast festivals and figuring out what was good and what wasn't for next year. Uh, be sure also to peep the full list of ses sessions on the Charlotte Podcast Festival website, charlottepodcastfestival.com, and share about this session on social media using the hashtag CLTPodcastFest. And by tagging the presented organizations, if you can, uh, individuals can also purchase a Charlotte Podcast Festival shirt, this fancy shirt right here on the website. Um, it's really cool. It's got... Uh, WFAE on it. It's got some cool stuff on the back. Anyway, you got to represent the podcast festival. They're selling fast. So get those and uh, represent. And now without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to our expert, uh, the producer, consultant, host, audio engineer, editor of The Go Show. In 2014, he began podcasting as a hobby to have fun with and talk about disc golf. In 2019, he left a salary job in digital marketing to start Go Joe Studios, a full-service podcast production and consulting company. Please welcome the one and only Andy Go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm clapping for myself to replicate the what I imagine is the standing ovation that everybody is virtually giving me right now. So uh, thanks so much, Joe, um, for that wonderful introduction. Big shout outs to WFAE, the whole team there, especially Joni Deutsch, uh, for organizing the uh, Charlotte's inaugural um, podcast festival. And uh, I'm so honored and glad to be here to be a part of this, uh, to be represented presenting podcasting and talking about this industry is just a huge honor for me. And to be able to speak to everybody here on this call is, is just really wonderful. Um, I do wish that we could all be here in person here in Charlotte so I could see you guys' faces and feed off of that energy that's in the room. Uh, unfortunately, that can't happen um, for at least the next little while, but we're going to make do with uh, the best that we have so far. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get into it. Um, First of all, uh, if you haven't already, please let me know where you're tuning in from in the chat. I love to know just where people are tuning in from, especially since this is a virtual event. Uh, obviously, we're, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina. WFAE is the NPR affiliate here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Fantastic, wonderful radio station that, I, uh, that I'm a sustaining member of and I, and I listen to on a daily basis. Um, but because we're virtual, I'm really interested to see, yeah, where else everybody is tuning in from. 
podcasting is such a digitally connected thing. Your podcast can reach anybody in the world that has an internet connection. So um, it really makes sense that we have a community here today with us that is tuning in from all over the world. Uh, so big shout out to everybody um, that's tuning in from wherever you are. Let's see, we got LA, we got DC, Jacksonville, the Philippines, New Orleans. Oh my gosh. Matthews, North Carolina. I live in Noda, so that might as well be another country for me. All right, enough with the jokes. Um, just kidding. The corny jokes are going to be here all day. But I want to go ahead and just let you know about the scope of what we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, this is an hour-long session, and we're going to be going through essentially the industry of podcasting. I saw a question in there from somebody else about gear, asking about gear. We're not going to really go over what gear to use in your podcast uh, this session. I do have another session coming up next week, uh, and Joe, you might have to remind me on this one when that is, but... I've got a uh, panel discussion where we'll, we'll be talking about how to sound your best from home. Um, we'll get that uh, information out there uh, at, before the class is over. But yeah, we are going to be here for about an hour. Uh, if we can stick around a little bit after that, I do have some time that uh, hopefully I'll be able to um, answer any questions or chat with anybody afterwards. Um, Meanwhile, I do want y'all to go ahead and put your questions into the chat during the presentation. We're not going to save Q specific Q&A time um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, I'd rather you guys just go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Joe is going to help me out. He's going to keep an eye on what questions are popping up and what seems most, uh, most prevalent. So, um, he's going to be letting me know what questions you guys have. I definitely want to make sure that we get most of your questions answered, that you get the most out of this time possible. Um, so if you have a question or if you want me to repeat something or clarify something, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat because if you have a question about something, chances are somebody else in the room does too. Monday, October 12th, um, Andy. Monday, October 12th is when your next thing It's in the chat. You guys can click there. There we go. Monday, yep. Monday, October 12th, uh, another virtual event. I believe that one's at noon. I believe that one's at noon. And uh, again, these are all free sessions that you can sign up for. Um, we'll be talking about how you can record at home and, and sound really good. Um, but I want to go ahead and get into uh, the presentation here because we got a lot of stuff to cover and not really a lot of time. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share my desktop. And we're going to get into the presentation. So, um, again, the title of today's session is From Money to Movie Deals. It's time to start taking podcasting seriously. You can see my contact information down there as well. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, not my Instagram handle. Um, just if you want my Instagram handle, I will uh, put that in the chat too at some point. Um, but not right now. You can email me too, andy at gojo.com or visit my website, gojostudios.com. So if y'all have questions for me afterwards, or if you want to follow up with anything, again, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email, send me a DM on Twitter, uh, visit my website, anything like that. Um, but we are going to be talking about the uh, industry of podcasting here today. But before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Andy Go. I am the owner and founder of Gojo Studios, which is a full service podcast production and consulting company based right here in Charlotte. Uh, I've been podcasting myself since 2014, but I launched Gojo Studios full time in January of 2019. So, we're a little under two years into the process here, and uh, and I'll be honest with you guys, starting my own business, podcasting has been the best decision I've ever made in my life. This is the most fulfilling and rewarding work I've ever done, and uh, and being able to be my own boss is truly special. So uh, so this work is is it means a lot to me for sure. Um, essentially, what I do in my work is I work with different clients who have their ideas for podcasts, but maybe don't know how to get them started, don't know how to get them recorded and edited and produced on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and everything else. And so that's really where I come in. I, I come in and consult with them to take their idea from, you know, just something theoretical into reality. Uh, I've worked with some really fantastic clients uh, here in Charlotte and around North Carolina, uh, including the Arts and Science Council here in Charlotte. Um, uh, Charlotte is creative. Uh, everyone from architects to scientists to Instagram influencers to um, 
workout studio owners, all sorts of different people. And I really enjoy that variety uh, of subject matter that I get to deal with in my work because there's all these different stories. There's all these different perspectives that I get to be privy to and translating those stories and ideas and everything else into a podcast, into something that plays well on the internet is just a lot of fun for me. And I really enjoy basically trading in ideas. Uh, In that time, uh, since 2014, not since 2019, I would say, I've published more than 500 different episodes across multiple different client projects. Um, I've gotten more than 450,000 downloads to this point across those projects. Definitely a good number. I'm very happy about that. Some of my current uh, podcast projects include the Biscuit CLT podcast, uh, Wake Up to Your Life. Uh, If anybody was actually on the... um, kickoff session yesterday with Mark Perez and Bernadette Joy. Uh, I produce their podcast as well. Mark Perez, the host of On Life and Meaning and Bernadette Joy's Crush This Debt are both projects of mine. So uh, first of all, I'm really proud of them for seeing their projects through and kicking off this wonderful festival. Uh, Some of my favorite podcasts that I'm listening to right now include Dissect, which we're going to talk about later on, uh, The Daily from the New York Times, LeVar Burton Reads. If you guys are my age, I'm 38, you know, I'm a little bit of an elder millennial, but if y'all are around my age, then you certainly know about LeVar Burton Reading Rainbow, and, uh, and you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, his podcast is really uh, required listening for sure. Um, Switched on Pop. Switched on Pop is a great music podcast. Uh, Solve is a podcast where they have voice actors acting out a murder mystery and you try to solve the murder mystery too. So it's a little bit of a spin on the traditional true co- true crime podcast and that you're, it's actually interactive. You get to try and solve the, uh, the mystery as it were. Conan O'Brien has a fantastic podcast, Planet Money, pretty much anything from NPR is all great uh, and gravy and Um, There's just a lot of stuff we could talk about there, but that's how we run through the hour uh, way too quickly. So let's talk about what we're actually going to go over here today. Really three main topics are what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Starting off with a brief history of podcasting. We're going to kind of go from the beginning of podcasting in the 1980s and and get us up to speed to where we are today in 2020. And then, of course, we'll uh, we'll spend some time talking about the industry uh, as it is here today. Um, as we sit post coronavirus and uh, post Spotify acquisitions and all that, we're going to see what the podcast industry looks like here today. We're going to see how many people are listening to podcasts, who's listening to podcasts, where the money's coming from, all sorts of fun stuff. And then at the end, we'll also talk about the future of the podcast industry. I've got some key questions that I think the podcast industry is really going to have to um, face when, uh, you know, as the next few years roll around and the continuing evolution of the podcast industry uh, continues to evolve. Um, Let's start off with first, actually, before I get into all that, Joe, let me go ahead and uh, see, do we have any questions so far? Because I know people probably have one or two things off the top of their head that they want to put out there. Does anybody have any anything that you, you see as a good question? Yeah, well, so far, everybody just giving you props on the LeVar Burton thing. Uh, yeah. Everybody loves LeVar that. Burton. Uh, but somebody did ask, what do you think of the future? What do you think the future of podcasting is? Okay. Um, we'll, we'll tackle that at the end of the uh, session because... Uh, oh, that's um, a question to everybody. Sorry. That's a question to everybody. Somebody said, why, uh, is, it, why is podcasting so fulfilling to you? Steve Kaplan says that. That is a fantastic question. For me, podcasting is is one of the most democratic mediums that we have. Um, podcasts are great, but really what podcasts are, are vehicles for stories and ideas. Stories and ideas are really what makes us human, right? Like what makes us who we are is being able to pass down stories and ideas from generation to generation. That's been happening since... You know, cavemen were, were scrawling rocks into the side of, the, uh, of cave walls and all that. You know, and then later on in history, it became written word on a piece of paper. And then it became TV and then radio. And now we have the internet. And the thing is, is that vehicle has changed throughout those years. But the stories, the ideas, the passions, the things that really make us human, those haven't changed at all. And that's what I really like about podcasting is that it's leveraging one of the most powerful um, phenomena of being a human into getting uh, your ideas and your passions across to the rest of the world. And, and that's really what it is, is being able to broadcast yourself to the rest of the world. That's something that we didn't have as just average people 
uh, even 20 years ago. If you wanted to be on TV or have a radio station, it was prohibitively expensive. It still is. And it's just not something that most people can do. But for a couple hundred bucks, maybe even less, actually for free, you can have a podcast that reaches anybody in the world with an internet internet connection. So that's just one of the things I like about podcasting. Any other questions, Joe? Yep. Kind of what made you get into it, which you kind of did. And then, uh, yep, just people agreeing with you. Uh, Melissa Miller says, especially as podcasts have become more accessible to the average person with social media, podcasts have created an avenue for everyone to be heard. So props to that. And, and Cass Otley asked, what made you get into podcasting? Absolutely. So, I, I, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of brief background on my professional history. So, um, I have a, I, I graduated from Indiana University uh, in 2005. I'm a born and raised Hoosier from Bloomington, Indiana. Um, but I had a sports marketing degree, had a telecommunication, telecommunications degree, didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. I uh, came here to Charlotte in 2006, uh, actually sold season tickets for the Charlotte Bobcats, who are now the Charlotte Hornets. Um, anybody who's familiar with the NBA knows that that's basically career suicide because you're, you're not going to sell much uh, here in Charlotte. But did that for a couple of years. Uh, didn't really jive with that. Did some middle, you know, mid-level uh, management for a couple of years. Didn't really jive with that. And really decided I needed to re reinvent my skill sets uh, probably around 2012 or so. Uh, it was that time when I started doing things like hosting trivia and bingo shows. Um, calling basketball games for uh, a local uh, Division II college here in town, Queens University. Uh, and then I also started uh, or tried to start an online independent radio station with a business partner of mine. And that's where I started podcasting is because uh, the radio station uh, needed content. And first of all, playing music is prohibitively expensive because you have to license all of it. Uh, but podcasting was a way that we could actually create content without breaking the bank. So that's when I started podcasting. Uh, the radio station didn't end up uh, panning out, but that work, I continued doing it for a couple of years. Um, I picked up another uh, digital marketing job that I worked at um, for the next four or five years. But while I was doing that, I was working on the side uh, to work with people like Bernadette and uh, people like Mark Perez, who I was working with on the side while I was working full time. And, and I just kept building a book of business from there. Uh, at the end of 2018, I really had a decision to make because I uh, had enough money in the bank that I could, I could conceivably go out on my own and quit my job. So I had to decide, you know, was, was it worth it to go out on my own and, and, and bet on myself and try and do everything, you know, with no safety net, or do I continue, uh, you know, working in this nine to five gig and just, you know, continue to climb the ladder there. And to be honest with you, it really wasn't even a question because once I really knew that I could do it, I knew there was no question that that's what I was going to do. So fast forward to January 1st, 2019, I've got my LLC filed and uh, we're, we're off and running. And uh, it, I've been doing that ever since, working with different clients. Uh, and uh, again, I, I really, really enjoy what I do. All right, um, let's move on to the next slide here. We'll get some more questions later. Let's first start off by defining what a podcast is. So here we have the Merriam-Webster's definition of a podcast, which is a program as of music or talk made available in digital format for automatic download over the internet. Not bad. What about dictionary.com? Dictionary.com defines a podcast as a digital audio or video file or recording, usually part of a themed series that can be downloaded from a website to a media player or computer. These are all good definitions, but not quite what I want to define podcasting as. This is the definition that I'm going to use for podcasts. And it includes one very big difference from those last two definitions. So I've defined it as a digital audio or video file made available on demand for download or streaming on the internet via, and this is the big difference, via an RSS feed. Now we'll talk about RSS feeds in a second, but RSS feeds are basically uh, computer files that allow for automatic updating over the internet. And for a podcast to really be a podcast and really to be distributed um, as democratically as we've talked about, then it needs to be uh, distributed via an RSS feed. And as we go through the presentation, why that is important will become more and more clear. 
So let's start off with a brief history of podcasting. Now, normally I like to, when I do this presentation in, in front of people in a live audience and all that, I like to ask people if they can identify who the two bespectacled individuals are in the middle of this photograph. Does anybody know? If you do, put it in the chat. If not, just, you know, act like you know. Um, but most people don't recognize the two people with glasses here in the middle of this photograph. I'll go ahead and tell you who they are. On the left there, that's Sarah Koenig. And on the right is Ira Glass. So those are two of the most successful podcasters uh, in the industry right now. Of course, they're uh, this, uh, Ira Glass is uh, from This American Life. He's one of the most prolific uh, public radio voices around. He's probably, if you're like me, he's probably guilted you into a couple of public radio donations in, in during your time, um, which, hey, WFAE appreciates. Uh, and then, of course, Sarah Koenig was the uh, host of, of, of uh, Serial, one of the big podcasts in 2014 that really kind of transcended where podcasts are. So uh, these two are, 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 are really kind of at the pinnacle or at the apex right now of podcasting, particularly as it relates to that narrative storytelling style of podcast that they do. Let's go all the way back to the beginning though. The first computer-based talk audio files started appearing around the 1980s. Now these were just really bulky files that were really just for computer programmers and other people who are really into their computer um, uh, practice. And it was just something that they could use to communicate back and forth about their uh, super computer involved uh, discussions. Uh, internet radio didn't really come around until 1993. And then once that came around, uh, there was a uh, show called The Computer Chronicles, which uh, is just what it sounds like. Is It's a bunch of guys with big glasses who are talking about computer gear and, and all that. They came up with a term that I, that I really like called asynchronous radio. A synchronous radio and uh, I had to look this up and if you knew what asynchronous meant before this congratulations but I didn't asynchronous is essentially the opposite of simultaneous meaning two different things that don't happen in the same time or in the same place I love it and we're already starting to get existential we're, we're I guarantee by the end of this presentation we're gonna have a Schrodinger's cat of uh, podcasting <laughs> it's either gonna be listened to or it's not uh, but asynchronous radio was was what it was known as back in the uh, early 90s. Now, in 1999, there was a huge uh, sort of uh, development, I guess you would call it, uh, called the RSS feed. The RSS feed is what allows for automatic updating with your computer. So no need to manually refresh sites for new posts or new information. Um, the RSS feed was introduced in 1999 via Netscape Navigator. So again, all my elder millennials out there, I know that you're looking at that pale bluish <laughs> um, ships steering wheel uh, logo that Netscape Navigator has. Um, but RSS is really the golden ticket of podcasting. First of all, what does RSS stand for? It does not stand for really simple syndication, as I like to tell people. It actually stands for RDF site summary, and RDF equals resource description framework. So RSS really stands for resource description framework site summary. Now, there's a little nugget of information that you can use at your next cocktail party to make sure that you are the life of the party. Trust me, I'm so much fun to hang out with at cocktail parties. <laughs> um, at least among radio people. Radio people get it. Um, but anyway, the RSS feed is really the most important part of the podcast. Now, again, like I said, the RSS feed allows for, for syndication and distribution. And that's really one of the key features of a podcast is a podcast must be syndicated or distributed via an RSS feed, which is what makes it widely available across the internet. If you don't have your show on an RSS feed, then that's really just kind of what it is. It's just a show. It's not really a podcast because it's not distributed via an RSS feed. Someone can't subscribe to your show and get automatic updates. So if your podcast does not involve an RSS feed, I'm sorry to tell you, you're not podcasting. You're just creating an audio show. <clears throat> 
Now, around this time, of course, this is when the name podcast started to appear. So at first, there was the term audio blogging that was coined by Dave Weiner in October of 2000. Uh, That was uh, around the time that Dave, who was a computer scientist, included the enclosure tag in the RSS feed that allowed for automatic updating. And actually, he published uh, the very first uh, use of an audio file via RSS feed uh, was in was January 11th in uh, 2001, and he published in his little e-newsletter, or uh, you know, the e-newsletter of the time. He published a link to the Grateful Dead song "Truckin." as part of his uh, as part of his new discovery. So there's a nice little piece of trivia for you. The first audio file ever played via RSS feed was a Grateful Dead hit. Now the term podcast didn't come out until about February of 2004 when uh, New York Times journalist Ben Hammersley started using it and he thought of it as a Portman 2, meaning a combination of the words iPod and broadcast. Now of course during this time iPods were a revelation in the media consumption world. It was, uh, you know, if you're if you're on the younger side, you probably won't appreciate just how big and uh, impactful iPods were at this time. No, to this point, uh, Walkmans were kind of the big thing, but uh, once iPods came in, they completely changed the games, and and they were really everywhere. So the word podcast comes from a, a combination of iPod and broadcast. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it wasn't until uh, Danny Gregory started using it that it uh, was brought into the mainstream. And then the last name that obviously didn't stick <laughs> was used by USA Today in February 2005. They called it Free Amateur Chat Fest. <laughs> Free Amateur Chat Fest, which, to be honest with you, may actually be a more uh, <laughs> accurate name for podcasts these days. But, uh, Joni, I don't know, the uh, uh, Joe, the Free Amateur Chat Fest Festival probably doesn't uh, sound as good as Charlotte Podcast Fest. So, I jokes- like it. <laughs> hey, next year we'll rebrand. Uh, next, uh, the joke is was ultimately on uh, USA Today, though, because later that year in 2005, the word podcast would go on to be named Word of the Year by the Oxford English Dictionary. So, podcast ended up sticking. Free amateur chat fest. Well, maybe we can get a revival for it going. Hey, Andy, uh, Andy, quick, can you clarify what you mean by update or syndication? Sure. So, syndication is really distribution, right? So when you're like, for instance, Seinfeld is probably one of the greatest examples of syndication out there because it's um, all these uh, local affiliates and TV stations all pay for the rights to be able to show uh, Seinfeld on their TV station. So syndication is really just the process of legally licensing out the ability for these end users to uh, broadcast content. So um, syndication in our uh, for our use is really distribution. So that's basically you taking your MP3 files, the ones that make up your podcast, and being able to, to distribute them across the internet. So when I say syndication, I would really think of the word distribution. Any other questions that we got, Joe? Nope, that's it. That was just a good one and it was poignant. So yep, definitely on with the show. <laughs> All right. So uh, between 2004 and 2010, podcasting continues to grow. As we see in 2004, Libsyn launches. Here's another Portman too. I love that word too. I love vocabulary. Come on, guys. I'm a podcaster. You got to expect these sorts of things. Libsyn is a Portman too of liberated syndication. <laughs> so not only are we, uh, you know, we're, we're getting a little meta here too. We're, we're getting real meta with the syndication thing, but Libsyn is actually the podcast hosting service that I recommend to all my, all of my clients. There's a ton of great ones out there, but Libsyn's the first one I usually recommend. Uh, in 2004, the word podcast uh, appears in Wikipedia. It, it gets its own page for the first time. Also in 2004, the first Google search for the term podcast appears. One year later, Apple adds podcast to iTunes. Also, 100 million Google searches for podcast in 2005. So in just a year's time, you've already got 100 million Google searches for the term podcast. In 2006, Ricky Gervais, British comedian, um, becomes the first big sort of 
revolutionary podcaster where a lot of people are listening to his show. Uh, an LA radio jockey named Lance Anderson creates the first live tour where he'd actually go around to bars and theaters and all that sort of stuff and perform his show. This American Life also becomes available as a podcast. Now, This American Life, of course, at that time had been just uh, one of the most uh, flat, it, it was a flagship radio show. It still is, of course, because it's still in production, but it's a flagship radio show from uh, WBUR in Boston. And uh, at that time, it was, of course, available just as a radio show. But in 2006, it became uh, available as a podcast as well. That's the show that, of course, Ira Glass hosts. Also, shout out to Virginia Tech, who launched the first university sponsored podcast in 2006. Moving on to 2007, uh, LA radio jocks uh, Jack and uh, Stench create the first monetized, excuse me, monetized podcast. 2009, Adam Carolla launches his podcast. And then just a year, really about two years later, Adam Carolla's podcast reaches over 60 million downloads, making him the world's biggest podcaster. And 2014 really is the year, I think, that transcended podcasting into kind of where it is now, into uh, a medium where in which everybody kind of knows about podcasting, or at least have heard of it. And two shows that really were the catalyst for that were Serial and Startup. Serial, of course, by Sarah Koenig, whose photo we saw earlier, um, that was the investigative podcast uh, dealing with the murder uh, or the case of Anand Syed, who uh, was found to have murdered his girlfriend in the late 1990s. Uh, that, of course, uh, was a huge podcast where everybody was talking about it. Everybody had their theories on whether or not he did it or didn't do it. Uh, and it really proved that if you could create a compelling story that just laid out the facts and let people uh, make up the minds for themselves, you could really great get some great content going that way. That, of course, spawned an entire subgenre of true crime and murder mystery shows like Favorite Murderer, My Favorite Murderer, Dirty John, so many others. Um, Serial, of course, still going on today. And then Startup. Startup, um, which uh, is, is, is a fantastic show. Season one of Startup detailed the founding of Gimlet Studios by host Alex Bloomberg, who at the time, <clears throat> again, just a, a, you know, a radio producer who uh, had done some really great stuff uh, in the public radio domain. But Startup was really the <laughs> story of how he got funding to start Gimlet Studios. And, and you listen to it in that first season. He, he builds Gimlet in real time on the podcast, which is just still to this day for me, some of the most um, engaging um, some of the most engaging uh, uh, podcasting out there, uh, especially as a solo entrepreneur. Uh, that also spawned a TV show called Alex Inc. That's on NBC starring Zach Braff. Uh, and, and I have not watched that show, but if anybody else has, please let me know how that is. That's, that's kind of funny. And then a quick note about start uh, or about, um, about Gimlet. They were eventually sold to Spotify in 2019. We'll talk more about that sale later on in the presentation. So that really kind of brings us up to where we are today um, with podcasting. Joe, do we got any other questions about the history of podcasting before we move on? Nope. Okay, cool. So here today in 2020, podcasting is a real thing. I mean, you know, you are here, you are tuning in to a virtual podcast conference uh, on your Tuesday evening. So clearly you're interested in podcasts. Uh, there's a whole industry that's been built around podcasting. And really podcasting is something that's going to continue to evolve. That makes it actually really uh, dynamic in the world of media right now because most other media, print, digital, uh, even TV is, is, is regressing, is, you know, it's, it's deteriorating. But podcasting continues to be, even during the coronavirus pandemic, continues to be something that's kind of pushing the edge and is evolving. And we don't know quite where podcasting is going just yet. I always like to liken where podcasting is now to a teenager in essence. So a teenager, you know, you can see that they've got the, 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 the structure there, right? Like they're, you know, they're six 
three or whatever, you know, uh, or, you know, they've reached their height. I should say, I don't know, six, three, that's probably too much, but you know, they've reached their height and uh, you know, you can see that the limbs are on them, but you know, maybe the, you know, the shirt hasn't quite filled out and maybe there's not, you know, any facial hair there yet. There's still an evolution that you can see is happening before it reaches maturity. And that's where podcasting is right now. It's got a lot of great things going for it. It's got a lot of great interest. There's money being, in, being uh, spent on podcasting, but in no way has podcasting reached its maturity, uh, not from a usability end, not from a content production end, none of that. So one of the coolest and most exciting things about podcasting to me is just that the industry is still growing, still evolving, and we just don't know where it's going to go. Um, but it's an exciting time to be in podcasting. First, let's ask, how many podcasts are there? There are currently between 1 and 1.5 million podcast feeds out there. Now, Apple Podcast is uh, still the biggest podcast directory in the world. And uh, I, would, I would say that most of those feeds that you see on Apple Podcasts or wherever else, they aren't all shows. They aren't fully fleshed out shows. A lot of them are dead shows, right? Shows that just haven't published in you know, a couple of months, a couple of years even. You know, maybe there's a few feeds that are on there just as proof of concept. Again, because the entry to the barrier to entry for podcasters is so low, you're going to see a lot of, you know, podcast projects that have fallen by the wayside. So while there might be one to 1.5 million feeds that you can go find, I would say, this is my estimate, but I would say there's probably only closer to 750,000 actual shows that are being produced on a regular basis. And, if, and then if you're, you know, upping up your uh, quality standards and your production standards, I mean, we're, I would say there's probably less than 200, I would say less than 100,000 some podcasts out there that are really worth your time. Uh, across all those uh, different shows, there's been 34 million published podcast episodes. So all that information, whenever I tell that people, uh, whenever I tell that to people, a lot of people will follow up with the next question, which is, hey, that's a lot of podcasts. Doesn't that mean this market is saturated? If I try to start my podcast now, isn't that just a waste of time because there's so much noise in the market? And my answer, of course, is no, absolutely not. And what I would say is think of podcasts more like a magazine instead of the radio right? Think of podcasting more like magazines instead of the radio because magazines, what they really do, think about your magazine rack at your local grocery store. It, th there are so many different magazines out there because they all cater to really specific niches. And that's what podcasting is doing right now. It's audio for these really specific um, audiences that really you can't reach any other way. Um, um, there's a podcast out there that is about, um, that gets about 1500 downloads an episode. 1500 downloads an episode is a lot. Like you can absolutely get sponsorship money for that. Uh, and it's all about breeding chameleons, right? So not just owning a chameleon, right? But breeding chameleons. So if a, a podcast like that can get 1500 downloads per episode, then whatever your topic is, whatever idea you have in your head for your podcast is just as capable of, of getting those uh, sort of download numbers. Hey, Andy. Yes, sir. What do you mean by publish podcast? Sure. So uh, publishing a podcast uh, online involves essentially getting it onto Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any of these other internet directories where people listen to podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Luminary, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, any, you know, all of these major podcast directories out there like that are basically the, the main clearinghouses for podcasts. And when you as a creator want to publish, essentially what you're doing is you are uploading your MP3 files Again, your podcast needs to exist digitally as an MP3 file. You're uploading it to a hosting service like Libsyn that we just mentioned, which then distributes it to all those different directories. And that's what I mean by publishing. It's you uploading your audio to the internet and then distributing it to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Deezer, Radio Public, all these different directories. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's good. And then two people kind of are asking the same thing. 
Um, what are realistic expectations for a successful podcast? That's from Rebecca. And at the same time, Clark asks, what's a good measurement of success, number of downloads, et cetera? So, I mean, it's all relative, but what do you, what's your take? <laughs> and, and yeah, my, my first answer would be that, which is that it really depends, which I know is the frustrating, non-evasive answer, but it's, it really does depend because uh, when you as a podcaster are starting out, you want to really define like what's going to make this project worth it for you. Um, having say 10,000 listeners is great, but if those listeners aren't engaging with your show, if they're not talking to you on social media, if they're not spending money on your sponsor's product, you know, what good are they in, in one sense, right? Like 10,000 downloads doesn't mean much if people aren't talking to you and, and doing stuff with you. You could, I, I would say it's, if you had a hundred listeners, right? Or 500 or a thousand, a smaller number, but those listeners are talking to you on social media. They're listening to every show. They're calling into your phone line. They're uh, spending money with your sponsors. That is going to be far more rewarding than having just a raw number of downloads out there. It's kind of like social media, right? Like on Instagram, having a hundred thousand followers on Instagram is great, but if they're not doing anything for you, then, then what's it, what's the point? You know, you, it's more about having engaged listeners than it is the raw number of listeners, uh, quality over quantity. Now that said, um, I would throw this out there on Libsyn because they're the oldest, most prolific podcast company out there. They have the data to, to, to look at things like this and the average number of downloads in a 30 day span for one podcast episode. So average middle of the road, complete middle of the road from day of publish to 30 days after, so you have a nice sample size, that's 150 downloads, 150. So if you publish a podcast online and 30 days after you have published it, you have 150 downloads, you are smack dab in the middle of all the podcasts published on Spotify or on uh, Libsyn. Now, wow. don't forget Libsyn includes stuff like, you know, Adam Carolla's show and, <laughs> and shows that are getting tens of thousands, if not millions of downloads. So, it, you know, it's a spectrum, but that's actually a good rule of thumb I've always kept is like a, is 150 is like smack dab in the middle average. I find a lot of new podcasters really, that's a good number to shoot for. And then after that, I would be looking at a thousand listeners and then 5,000 listeners at 5,000 listeners. Then you can really start commanding good um, sponsorship money from like real advertisers, people who are using like dedicated um, equations to price out how valuable your podcast is. But 5,000 is kind of like once you're at 5,000, then you're playing with like on, on the big boy stage. Um, yeah, that's you know. good. That's good stuff. Uh, Logan, I, Logan asked another quick question. It's right in with this. Um, he's saying he's, he's hearing that listen through rate becomes more important is becoming more important or just as important to advertisers as downloads. Do you absolutely. believe that? Absolutely, absolutely. So that is a, a, a good piece of information to know as a producer. <clears throat> Listen through rate is the rate at which uh, it, it's basically how long people are listening to your podcast before they drop off. Industry standard is between 50 to 66%, so one half to two thirds of your podcast. If you're averaging somewhere in there, it's pretty good. Pretty good. People aren't just like hit and play and then tuning out because they're like, oh, I don't like this person's voice or, oh, I just hit the wrong podcast or something like that. You know, if you're down below 50%, that's probably concerning. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, again, it comes down to how engaged your listeners are. I, me personally, I'd rather have 100 people listening who are listening to 85, 90% of the podcast rather than 10,000 listeners who are listening to 20% of the podcast. But yes, very important. And also, so that um, will help determine where your advertising goes, right? <clears throat> a lot of advertisements go either in the pre-roll at the beginning of the show or in the mid-roll um, at the middle, in the middle of the show. Mid-roll ads are statistically proven to be the most effective ones. But if your listen-through rate is below 50%, then, well, then you got a problem. <laughs> Any other questions there, Joe? Yeah, I got another. <clears throat> how, many, how many more slides you got to get through? Nah, don't worry about it. Let's, let's hear it's just Okay, you want to hear them? We'll go, okay. Uh, we have some good one. ones. One more question. Okay. What, one. what number listener stats would you think about initiating a membership model? Like where, where should their, their listener stats be before they start a, a membership model? Hmm. 
That I feel like is very subjective because again, if you can start off the gate with 20 listeners, I mean, you're already making money on that with just 20 listeners. Um, that I th think you would have to just look at your, I, we would have to talk about your goals and, and all the other things that you have that you, you would want to, but there's no reason why you can't start off in a, in a, in a premium mo model right off the bat. Uh, the hosting services like Libsyn, Podbean, Blueberry, they all have private hosting um, um, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, premium hosting services that you can actually put that stuff behind a paywall. Um, Patreon too. You can do that too. So um, no reason why you can't start with that. Okay. I'm going to keep moving on the slides. Don't forget, we'll have a little Q and a Q and a time after this. Cause I see, that. Holy crap. We are already way yeah, through we're, this. We're, we're getting close to the podcast, the Q and a time. So I'll let you get, get to those slides. All right. No more questions. Yeah. Then, and then we'll do <laughs> yeah. We'll do it when you're done real quick here. So these are just some of the most popular podcast networks out there. NPR, Stitcher, Wondery, um, all this information is available via Triton Digital. I'll send some links out in the chat um, later. Again, some of the top podcasts here in the U.S. Joe Rogan Experience is always up there. The Daily, Crime Junkies, a bunch of this stuff uh, you've probably listened to. So I really want to show you guys what the industry looks like here in 2020. So this stat right here, th these next few slides are going to give you some information about that. The Infinite Dial is a uh, report that comes out once a year that really talks about the digital trends going on in the industry. This slide right here is showing us the number of people in the U.S. age 12 and above who have heard of the word podcast. That doesn't mean they've ever listened to a podcast or know what a podcast is, but they've heard of the word podcast. So that's three quarters of the in entire US population or 212 million people. That's a five point jump from just 2019. I mean, you can see the growth from 2014, how it's, I mean, that's not explosive, but that is solid growth all the way around. Um, good numbers there. Podcast listening. Here is the number of people who have listened to at least one podcast in their life. That's over half of the U.S. population, 55 million people, 100, or I'm sorry, 55%, 155 million people. Um, that is a real number. Like once something's reached over 50% penetration in the U.S. market, like that is big business. We're not playing, you know, small time anymore. How about monthly listeners, people who are a little bit more regular on their listening? That's 37% of the United States population or 104 million people listening to at least one podcast every month. And then weekly listeners are P1 listeners. Uh, radio noise here man just want to make sure we got everybody on mute here um, Andy unmute yourself sorry <laughs> All right, there I we muted, go sorry I muted everybody so start that sentence over no worries. So again, 24% of the population is a weekly podcast listener listening to at least one and probably more podcast every single week. These numbers are only going to continue to grow. Let's talk about money though too. Ad revenue here for podcasting um, in 2018. Well, these charts show 2017, 2018, 2019. But as you can see, the total market estimate for 2019 is about 700 million dollars. It's expected to cross a billion dollars in 2021 next year. Now, just to give you some context there, the entire um, amount of ad revenue in the radio industry is about $17 billion. So podcasting still has quite a ways to go. But when I look at those numbers, all I see is $17 billion that can be shifted towards podcasting, which means there's only room for growth in podcasting. Here are some of the top uh, categories or top genres of podcasts that advertisers like to advertise on. You got news, comedy, society, and culture, true crime. I can't believe true crime is all the way down there at fifth, but that's the case. Um, and what types of companies are advertising on podcasts? A lot of them are retail, direct to consumer, financial services, telco, uh, telecom, 
professional services. Uh, a bunch of this stuff right here. Again, if you are advertising or if you are a podcast host, these are the type of companies that you want, might want to think about in terms of getting on, uh, getting onto your podcast. And also if you are the marketing manager at your business or somebody who has ad dollars available, this is another way that you can think about podcasts is by advertising on the podcast that you want. The greatest podcasts uh, deliver you to a audience that is tailor-made for what you're trying to do. So why would you advertise on a podcast? Number one is the human connection. The greatest example of this I can give you is Oprah. Now, through other mediums, including podcasts, books, and TV shows, and everything else, she's built up this really great rapport with her audience such that no matter what she says, people are going to do it. If she says the Charlotte Mecklenburg phone book is going to be the best book of 2021, guess what's going to be on the New York Times bestseller list next week? Charlotte Mecklenburg phone book. But that's the power that Oprah has. And a great podcast host doesn't have to be Oprah necessarily, but will really engender that same sort of feeling, that direct human connection feeling between her and her listener. And then podcasts obviously sit, um, you know, we can take them everywhere, right? They're on our phones. We have our AirPods. We can listen to them anywhere. That's really key because in those places like your commute, working out, walking the dog, uh, cooking dinner, things like that. Normally, if you were doing those things, you could only listen to music if you wanted some intellectual stimulation. Now you have podcasts. Podcasts represent a different sort of way of connecting with people. And if you're an advertiser, those are times that you can't reach people via you know, Instagram, YouTube, blogs, uh, whatever else. Podcasting, you can. And then obviously that um, is an opportunity to reach new listeners. And like I said, it's really about reaching niche listeners. Like, I don't know if you want to reach people who are all about breeding chameleons, but if you did, there's a podcast out there for you to advertise on, right? You know, just like um, um, Ortho Carolina is a great example here in Charlotte of somebody who's using podcasting to get in front of niche audiences. They sponsor the Queen City Podcast Network, who is a presenter of this festival, and they are putting podcasts in all or advertisements in all their podcasts, reaching whole new audiences. Um, some numbers here on the effects of COVID. Real quick, I'll just say there was a quick, there was a little dip in podcast listening when the pandemic first hit uh, as the commutes and daily routines changed. But at this point, podcast listening is back above where it was before that. So podcasting really is not going to be affected too much by the, by the, um, by the pandemic. In fact, if anything, it's growing stronger. Uh, Apple podcast reported the most number of podcasts submitted to the podcast directory in May of this year, I believe most in one month ever. So it's not slowing down. Let me give you guys a little case study here on one of my favorite podcasts, Dissect. Dissect is a music podcast that um, features one host here, a guy named Cole Kushner, who's pictured. And, and he's just a regular guy, right? Lives in Sacramento, California, uh, has, had a full-time gig and uh, you know family and all that, wife and kids. And he created this podcast, which basically just analyzes out full albums in a super granular, granular level way, just beat by beat, lyric by lyric, really, really cool music nerd stuff if you're like me. But what he did was that, first of all, he made a great product. The podcasts are excellent. There's a lot of research and attention to detail that goes into them, and you always learn something from them. They're fantastic listens. But he's also engaging on social media and a great follow there too. So as he builds up this uh, organic following, again, just being a regular guy, had a $100 USB microphone, probably just like you here in the audience. He, midway through his second season, and I'll just move on to this next slide here because I realize I'm just discussing this next slide. But halfway through his second season, Cole was approached by Spotify, by Spotify to make Dissect a Spotify studio program. So he struck a deal during the middle of his second season, maybe three years ago, to produce, Spot, to produce Dissect for Spotify full-time. Now he gets paid a full-time wage to do what he loves. And I don't know how much money that is. I don't, know if he's, I don't know if he's a millionaire or not, but I do know the guy lives in Northern California and it's not cheap to live there. And he supports a family and a kid off of whatever Spotify is paying him to do. And of course, the work that he's doing is the work that he loves to do. And so for me, this is a great illustration of where the podcast industry is at and how you as somebody getting into the industry should approach it. Um, because, I, you know, as we talked about, there are, 
uh, you know, you can get a monthly sponsor for your podcast and make a couple hundred bucks a month or whatever. That's fine. But really to me, if you're wanting to make a good impact podcasting, I would shoot for being someone like Cole Kushner or Aaron Mankey of Lore and Cabinet of Curiosities or Jessica Williams and Phoebe Robinson of Two Dope Queens. These are all people who are just like us, literally just everyday people who have ideas, passions, stories that they want to tell. They started off with a, you know, probably nothing more than just a USB microphone and they work their butts off to make great podcast content. Now, what happened is, is that, you know, studios like Spotify, Pandora, um, uh, Stitcher, they are all looking for the rights to good original content. And I'm going to say that again, because this is one of the most important things I'm going to say during this whole presentation. All those publishing companies are looking to own the rights to great original content. And here's why. And this even happens in video too, right? With Netflix and, uh, and Hulu and such. So for an example, on Netflix, if you stream Breaking Bad on Netflix, Netflix doesn't really get the biggest chunk of that revenue change because the rights to Breaking Bad are owned by AMC. Now, if you stream Stranger Things on Netflix, ah, Netflix now gets a much bigger chunk of that revenue check because they own the rights to Stranger Things. So owning the rights to the original content is the most important things for these companies. So it, they have, um, I don't know if you've called them A&Rs or what, <laughs> I don't know if they have a name like that, but they have people who have checkbooks, who have lots of zeros behind them, who are looking for good original content that can't be found anywhere else, that speaks to an audience that can't be found anywhere else. If you can create that, I guarantee you a Spotify, a Pandora, Hulu, who knows, they are going to be interested in your product and that can lead to not only obviously money, but speaking engagements, book deals, movie deals, all of that is going on right now for all the people listed here on, on this page. And that is really the secret sauce that I would say that you should be looking at when you're approaching the podcast industry. It's not about making $500 a month from some sponsor, right? You're not going to replace your full-time income by doing that. But if you use your podcast to stand out from everyone else, to bring something new to the table, to talk about something that people want to hear about, then you're creating an audience, an asset that can't be replicated anywhere else. And that's when you're going to have something that's really going to work for you. Let's keep going here. I know we got just a few more minutes, but I'm going to try and finish through um, these next few slides here and then we'll do some Q&A. I really want to talk about Spotify and their impact on the podcast industry. Um, they are literally changing the podcast game right now as we speak. So starting in 2009, Spotify started investing uh, a lot of money, more than $850 million to this point acquiring podcast talent. So Gimlet, right? The podcast studio that was created in startup, they bought Gimlet and all the writers there. And really that's what they were buying, right? The writers to these shows because they want to create great content. Anchor. Anchor is a free, all-in-one podcast recording and publishing app that works on, I, on Mac or, or, I guess, on your iPhone or your Android. So you could actually download Anchor right now and start podcasting right away and get published on Apple Podcasts and everything else. It's the easiest way to do it. Um, so they bought that so that they can get people creating content that will feed their marketplace so that then they will have more content that they can put out there. I mean, you see where this galaxy brain stuff is going, right? It's, it's not too, it's not too obscured. The ringer Bill Simmons podcast network and video network, huge numbers that he does there. Joe Rogan experience. This was actually just a few months ago. This was one of the most seismic moves possible because Joe Rogan is the most popular podcast in the United States. And all of that is doing Spotify or, um, you know, adding dissect and the Michelle Obama podcast and all of that other stuff. All of that is doing is converting casual subscribers to paid subscribers. And then once those paid subscribers are there, they're listening to more podcasts. And remember what I said about getting a bigger chunk of the ad revenue when you own the material, same things at play here. When you stream old town road or Taylor Swift, on Spotify. Spotify doesn't like that actually. Spotify really doesn't like that because that means they owe, they owe a lot more money to the um, 
rights holders, the ASCAPs, the BMGs and all that, or BMIs, all that sort of stuff, they get the lion's share of the check. But when you spend time um, streaming Spotify or spring, streaming the Michelle Obama podcast, Joe Rogan or Dissect, now Spotify is making a much bigger return on their per customer um, rate than they were before. I'm talking like four or five times bigger. It's a huge deal. That's why they're spending $850 million acquiring all this talent. Um, podcast, uh, Spotify right now is the number two podcast directory in the U S but it will probably be number one within a year's time. It already is number one in Canada, Germany, France, Mexico, Spain, and others. And, uh, let me just finish out here with a couple of questions about the future of the industry. Um, here are some really existential questions that are facing the podcast industry because of some of that money, really, that, uh, that is being poured into the industry, which, trust me, I think is a good thing because the more money that's being poured into the industry means more opportunities for people like me, more opportunities for people like you, and, you know, in an even bigger and better Charlotte Podcast Festival next year. So, first of all, Will podcasts continue to be free and accessible or will they disappear behind paywalls? That's a huge, huge existential question, right? I mean, we talked about how cool podcasting is because it's democratic and you can get it anywhere in the world for free. What happens when Luminary and Spotify and Stitcher put all your favorite shows behind their paywall and then you got to pay $9.99 a month for it just like you do with Netflix and Hulu and everything else? Will content creators be able to compete with these massively funded studios? $850 million in Spotify? How am I with my $100 microphone supposed to compete with that? That's a question that's going to be, you know, big moving forward is are you going to be able to compete with that as an independent producer or do you have to be with Spotify or whomever else to be, to be heard? How will podcasts continue to monetize? That's certainly not an easy question to answer even today. Will search and discovery prevent podcasts from becoming more transcendent? Think about this. 30% of the people who don't listen to podcasts say they don't listen because it's too expensive. Let me repeat that one more time. 30% of the people who listen to podcasts or don't listen to podcasts, they don't listen because they think it's too expensive. So they don't even know the fact that it's free. They don't even know the fact that it's on their phone right now. They don't even know that they can listen to one right now. So that show, shows you that there's still a huge disconnect, despite those big numbers that I showed you, there's still a huge disconnect in how people even understand what a podcast is. You know, what kinds of new content are we going to be pushing ideas forward? I don't know. That's for you guys to decide. I know somebody watching this right now has a killer idea for a new podcast, and that's what Spotify is looking for. That's what Pandora is looking for. Who's going to be the next serial? Who's going to be the next startup? What's going to be the next podcast that you absolutely have to listen to, and you're going to be way behind uh, with all your friends if you don't listen to? What's the tiger king of podcasting? Where is it? Do you have it? If you do, let me know because like I can actually help you bring it to life and then we can make some money together and really do some good stuff. But either way, be thinking about that. Joe, I think I'm just uh, at a good stopping point right here, man. So, Thanks, um, Andy. I'm, yes, we got a little yeah. over 7 o'clock, but I got three good questions that people want to want answers to uh, that was in those last 20 minutes or so. Number one yeah. is how often should somebody release episodes? Is there a rule? Should it be weekly? So, uh, again, the answer here is going to be it depends. The most important thing to think about when you're releasing podcasts is consistency. So, if you release podcasts every Monday at 9 o'clock, you better release your podcast on Monday at 9 o'clock. Otherwise, you're essentially breaking your agreement with your listener. Mm -hmm. What you want is your listener to be anticipating the podcast the night before it publishes. New episodes of Dissect appear on Spotify every um, Tuesday morning. And I can count on that. It's like clockwork. And uh, if, if, if for whatever reason a podcast wasn't there, well, now I'm starting to question like what's going on. Like, are they, are, are they you know, producing new episodes? Did something happen? Did the host die? Like what happened? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. Uh, it really doesn't matter if it's once a week, twice a week, three times a month. Just be consistent about be consistent. it. Consistent, yes. Number two, if somebody's launching a new podcast, should they have a whole bunch of episodes in the can first or... Can they just do them weekly or as they go? 
Fantastic question. These are great questions. Um, so that's uh, what I call batch processing. And I absolutely recommend it to anybody who can realistically do it. If you if your content is evergreen and it needs to be timely, now that may not be such a good idea. But if, if your stuff's evergreen, I absolutely recommend having three to five episodes in your back pocket before you even publish your first episode. Because what that does is it gives you a little runway between now and the next time that you have to publish. Because if you go and you publish your first episode and you don't have anything else in the can, you're already on the clock for that next episode. And if you're trying to publish every single week, whew, that's a lot of stress, man. It, is, it will get stressful. It will get stressful quick. But if you've got five episodes in your back pocket, you're not stressed about making that next episode next week. In fact, maybe you take a vacation. Maybe you dial out for a little bit. You know, you, you take back control of your time when you batch process. So yes, absolutely, I recommend it if you can. Uh, you're stressing me out. My wife and I were weekly uh, every week until the pandemic. She's a teacher. We have no time. Now it's like once a month. It's crazy. But I'm going to get back to it. All right. Anchor. I have two questions about Anchor. Is there anything yeah. to be cautious of when starting off on Anchor? After these two questions, we're going to have to wrap it up. But anything to be cautious of when starting off on Anchor? And, and uh, someone said that Anchor isn't very transparent with podcast data, which is why it's free. They've heard. Is that is that true? Yeah, yeah. It? There, there is some truth to that for sure. Um, before Anchor was bought by Spotify, they actually got in some real hot water because um, some people started parsing through their terms and services of agreement and they had a setting in there that defaulted it to if you publish through Anchor that they would own your RSS feed. It's a huge no-no. Huge no-no, right? That's like... Um, that's like the record company owning 90% of uh, TLC's, uh, you know, records. <laughs> That's bad news. You want to own your own RSS feed and all your MP3s. It's all intellectual property that you own and have need to have the rights to. You don't want to give that to somebody else because they can monetize off of it and, and cut you off. And that's kind of what, pod, what Anchor was doing. They were putting ads in your podcast and you don't really have a chance to edit it out and who knows what the ad is for and you're sure you're sure uh, you're not going to see any money off of that so there were some real questions about anchor before that they've cleaned some of those up since spotify has bought them they're a little bit better on it now i haven't actually published through anchor so i'm not totally sure um but for me personally, I would be still very wary of that. Um, to me, the ease of editing and recording all from your phone does not match the um, what you get out of it at the end. Uh, it's much better off to have control over your podcast and own the rights to it and everything else that goes into it and not even let anybody near that stuff. So now I will say that if you want to just go ahead and get on the internet and start podcasting, Anchor is still a great place to go. You can always change your feeds over. You can always change your feeds over. But, you know, if you're going to be real, if you already know you're going to be serious about it, I'd look at Libsyn. I'd look at Blueberry. I'd look at Podbean. Something more traditional. Yeah, that's cool. And so I think kind of maybe to wrap it all up, one of the big things you're saying is you really need to get the attention of the Spotify's and the uh, uh, Stitchers and stuff because they want to buy your stuff. What is the best way to do that? Just get more listens? Like you're not going to get that until you get all your listenership up, right? Hmm. Not necessarily. I mean, if you can create a, a buzz in the right places, you know, on social media or um, in, in just within the uh, industry that you're doing. I mean, if you are a... Um, There's no way to submit directly to those guys, right? There's not like an online submission like, hey, use my idea. Oh, no, nothing, nothing that formal. I mean, it's, it, you know, at that point, you're, t you're talking about just having to use your networking skills, having to be, you know, it's kind of like finding a job, right? Like it's not submitting your resume through the online portal. It's emailing the, the hiring manager, the person who's actually going to hire you and introducing yourself that way. I would look at it more like that. Um, you know, first, I mean, first thing that you want to do, you want to build your audience and you want to make sure you have a healthy audience. Uh, but at that point, after that, you just want to make sure it's in the hands of people who can get it in the hands of people who are at Spotify. So are people in the chat rooms talking about it? Are people in your Instagram circles talking about it? You know, is it on Reddit? You know, is it on, you know, if there's a subreddit for your particular topic, are you putting it there? Um, good buzz will get heard, right? Good buzz will get heard because they are paying people on salary to keep their ears to the, to the ground and look for those people with buzz. So just create the buzz, worry about creating good content, everything else will follow. 
That's great. Andy, that's a great place to end there. I think if you're good, thank you so much for going a little extra with us, Andy. Everybody, let's hear it for Andy Go. Go Joe Studios. Follow him on Instagram. Follow him on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, Check out charlottepodcastfestival.com. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Andy, any last parting words? This is my dog, Gus Gus. Say hi to Gus Gus. <laughs> Bye, Gus Gus. Take care. No, seriously, everybody. though. Yeah, go ahead. Good last word. Um, you, ideas and, and um, words are so very important. Uh, they're the most important thing that we have. And when you have a platform like this, you almost have a responsibility to put out good ideas and content out there. So if you do create a platform, you do create an audience, um, remember that you have a great responsibility as well. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everybody. Check out all the other sessions. The Charlotte Podcast Festival is just getting started. We got stuff tomorrow. We got stuff the rest of the week. We got happy hours on Friday. Sign up, drink with us, party with us, enjoy, listen with us, create with us. Have a great night. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Yes.